Welcome everybody to the Rye Town Park Commission meeting uh, of February 15th, 2022. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, <clears throat> this meeting is a hybrid meeting. We have four members of the commission sitting at the dais. Uh, we're expecting at least one more via Zoom. And a uh, member of the staff, I guess, are going to also appear uh, on our screen magically. And of course, we have uh, members of the public here to view and or present. Um, Debbie, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Hurd? Here. Commissioner Jackson? Here. Commissioner Cohn? Joshua's gonna appear by Zoom. Yes, I've been texting you this night. He was there, I don't know oh. where he, I don't know if he's on Zoom, but he was there before. All right, Acting Commissioner Klein? Here. President Suckerman. Here. Uh, uh, pardon me, I, I uh, omitted uh, Commissioner Marino, who, who is not here. Debbie, I, I, I was muted. I uh, Understood. Uh, Welcome. And you're, you're appearing in Italy as well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, public comment on non agenda items. Uh, is there anybody on Facebook who wants to make a comment? There's nobody yet. Okay. However, I do have a letter written to the commissioners by Jamie Jensen that I can read a portion of. Sure. Uh, dear commissioners, I am sorry I cannot attend February's meeting of the Park Commission. I had three points to make during the session. Uh, Non-agenda item. Number one, please, as the staff and commissioners of Rytown Park, do not put aside the pursuit of moving our lawn maintenance program in-house and introducing electric vehicles to our fleet. I believe that elected officials and park departments across our state need to lead by example. We should be striving for green certification. I am pleased to see that the operating budget before you responds to Commissioner's ja Commissioner Jackson's concerns last month and the staff has put in place a backup plan in other words, putting the current lawn maintenance vendor on a month-by-month -month contract. So many in the city are in support of a quieter, more green approach to caring for our park. Please let me know if, as a citizen, I can be helpful in moving this agenda item forward. And a second uh, p uh, paragraph, in support of Poetry Path. The Poetry Path presentation today reflects many, many months of input from Rye Park staff, park users, and nonprofit leaders from the Rye Arts Center, the Rye Free Reading Room, the Rye Historical Society, and the Friends of Rye Town Park. Amy Vijanagar. Amy I beg your pardon. Amy V. <laughs> and her peers work on this project reflects the best of what citizens can do to truly make our park a place that is welcoming and wonderful, brava. Uh, and uh, uh, Jamie made a third point with regard to the new beach fees, which has been addressed because it was an oversight on my part. Right. Thank you very much. And Jamie, thank you for your comments. And speaking of the Poetry Path presentation, number one on the agenda, uh, Amy V. I got to tell you, I'm excited about this. I saw that um, the this, the slides. It really looks terrific. Thank you. I'm glad to hear. Thank you. Let everybody else enjoy it. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Fijanegar. That was very, very close. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tricky name. It was very close. Um, I just want to say thank you for welcoming me back again here this evening. It's so nice to see you all in person. I guess in the spring, the last meeting I was at, we were on Zoom. So it's nice to see you all in person. 
Um, I'm a proud resident of the city of Rye and a very close neighbor to Rye Town Park. Thrilled to share an update with you on the Rye Poetry Path. So just to update you on our progress since the last time I uh, shared the concept with you, uh, we have chosen 39 poems for Rye Town Park. This is um, as a committee made up of members of the park staff together with the Friends of Rytown Park um, under the leadership of the poet in residence who we brought in, Ian Pollock. He's the chair of the English department at Rye Country Day School, also a published poet. Um, and these 39 poems are part of a total of 82 in the whole project. There are 16 poems that will be presented at Edith Reed and another 26 at the Rye Nature Center and one at the Knapp House. So that makes up the 82. Uh, the goal is to have all installed by April, which is National Poetry Month, So, um, and I think we are hopefully on schedule. Uh, we selected 10 to begin with because 39 felt like a big chunk to do at once. So we chose, oh, thank you. Uh, we chose 10 poems that we felt were representative of the project and also not particularly difficult to, oh, was that me? Could be me. Okay, um, we selected 10 poems to begin with that we are anticipating being able to install uh, end of February, beginning of March. And um, I wanted to let you know also that permissions from rights holders are underway. We've hired somebody um, who, is an, who is an expert in obtaining permissions from rights holders um, who has been, uh, I would say, at least, a, at least half, if not two-thirds, of the poems that we selected for the project we have permission to use. It's really a formality. It's the right thing to do, but it's not that... My understanding is from this person that we've been working with, it's not that any of the poems we wouldn't be given permission to use. It's just that we have to go through the process of formally requesting and being granted permission to use them. So, um, this is um, a map that we've created that will appear on the project website that I wanted to share with you, not only because I think it's adorable, but also because it shows you the location of all 39 poems. Um, the poems, as I mentioned, were selected through a process, a consultative process, as well as the location for each poem. We really put a lot of time and effort into very, we hope, we feel thoughtfully choosing where each poem should go and which poem should go where. Um, this map will be interactive. Each of those dots will be clickable as the poems are installed. When somebody clicks on the dot, it will take them to the full poem, the poet. Um, we hope at some point to have audio and video on the website so that people can see and hear the poem spoken, as well as a photo of the poem in the spot in the park. Um, so that's the map. These are the first 10 poems that have been selected for the project. Um, and I apologize for the, for the short notice, but we, we, we did send, um, I did send a slide deck to everyone with details on the first 10. So when I'm finished, if you have any questions about any of them, I'd be happy to share more information um, about the details of how each poem will be presented. But these are the first 10 that we have um, selected to start with. And I was th I've been thrilled to learn today that the Friends of Ride Town Park has generously agreed to underwrite the cost of installing these first 10 poems, which is wonderful news, thank you. Um, I just wanted to show you, we've developed a welcome sign. We're having four of these printed up um, to be placed at various spots, and, you know, the, um, the two entrances of the park on Rye Beach Avenue and Dearborn Avenue, as well as um, probably the entrance by the parking lot and the other far entrance at the corner, Forest and Rye Beach Avenue. Um, there is a QR code on here that will take people to the website. The little blank space in there is for the new friends of the beautiful new Friends of Rytown Park logo. Um, and the same exact sign is appearing at Edith Reed and at the Ray Nature Center. So there's a consistency across the project. Um, similarly, and I brought a little bit, a little rough mock-up if anybody wanted to see it, but there will be a four by eight inch um, aluminum sign that will be placed probably low to the ground next to each poem that has a QR code that takes people to that specific uh, poem. And yes. <laughs> We're just 
discussing white versus silver background, but otherwise, um, that's what it will look like. And there's a space on this poem I wanted to mention to acknowledge uh, both who designed, painted, sculpted, created, what have you, the poem, and also who's um, sponsoring it. I just wanted to mention this since I have you all here. Um, this is something that we're very excited about. Please mark your calendar. April 24th, the Rye Poetry Path is sponsoring a concert, um, most likely at the Rye High School Performing Arts Center. We will have high school musicians performing music paired with 10 poems selected from the Rye Poetry Path. Um, so um, mark your calendars, but also when we're ready to promote this in the community, we'd love your help spreading the word. We'd love to pack the house. Uh, we have students performing. We have, um, I think, six of our local high schools are sending students to participate in this, multiple genres. We're hoping this will be not only a celebratory, but an ed educational opportunity for the community. So next steps is um, we're hoping for your approval to go ahead and install the first 10 poems. Um, like I said, happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, anticipate having the rest of them, the remaining 29 to share with you at the next meeting in March so that hopefully we can install those by April. Uh, just to let you know, the Rye Arts Center is planning to issue a call for artists through their network as well as through Arts Westchester to bring in hopefully some artists to help design some of the remaining poems. The reason is some of them lend themselves possibly to something of a mural or a small sculpture, but we'd like to bring in some artists to um, help us with the remaining poems. We'll be looking to secure sponsorships for the remaining poems um, and as I said, hope to install those March and April. And that's all I have. If you have any questions? I did want to also bring to show you just a sample. Um, this is one of five pieces of uh, the poem Speaking Tree by Joy Harjo, who happens to be our current uh, U.S. Poet Laureate. She's a Native American poem, writes some really beautiful poems about nature. This is a piece of acrylic that was engraved by the Wright Arts Center, um, which is really a really wonderful in-kind contribution on their part that they're willing to do some of the actual work producing these poems. This is white paper that will come off when we finish cutting this to size, um, but just to give you an idea of sort of what they look like. Uh, but this is a five-part poem, so it's five pieces that will be affixed to five of our sycamores in the tree, in the park. So if anybody wants to see this. Yeah, we spoke of the consultant forester as well as the arborist that works in the park just to make sure that however we, if we're affixing anything to a tree, to make sure that we do it in a way that's tree safe. Thank you for it's your consideration. It's great. It's awesome. Yeah, nothing's been planned okay. yet. I mean, part of this project, part of, I think, the, the spirit of it is that it is sort of something that you kind of discover, like a little bit of a secret okay. in a way, you know, that you that you happen stumble to be in the park and you yeah. stumble upon something that sure. makes you stop and look and think and perhaps have a conversation with somebody. So that's sort of part of it, um, but I don't see why we can't. I mean, my hope is that we can do events in this sense of, you know, poetry readings and writing activities and community. I mean, the hope is that this will be of use to everybody in some way, schools, houses of worship, neighbors, you know, yeah. people can can take from the poems what they find. Thank you. Labor of love. Yeah. <laughs> Teresa? Yeah, I would, I would also say I'm very excited about this, having been involved in it at the county level. Um, are you, and I hate to ask this question because it's not necessarily about Rytown Park, but are you doing the install at Reed at about the same time? That's in March, April? Yeah. The okay. goal is to finish them all by April. We have similarly, there's 16 poems at Reed and similarly a first batch of 10 um, that we'll be discussing with them actually this week as well. And assuming they're on board with those first 10, we're gonna be installing them basically parallel to okay. this process. Mm -hmm. And I should know this, but um, what is the sort of duration of the project? How long will they stay up? That's an excellent question that everybody's been asking. Okay. And really, um, so I'm glad you asked. It's you know, the way I see it is the poems can be there as long as they're meaningful for people. So they're being designed such that they could stay years, okay. but all of them could be removed in five minutes. Sure. So they're like, you know, they're, they're vinyl letters, they're things nailed to trees. I mean, they're not, nothing is like permanent in the sense of 
cement, you know, oh my gosh, it's a big deal to remove it. But the hope would be that, and they're also being designed such that they require little, if any, maintenance. Um, but my hope is that they're there as long as they're meaningful and they help us. Yeah. However long the, that we feel that they're meaningful to the community, they can stay. Yeah, or, yeah. you know, maybe in a year or two, we, if one poem we say we need to switch this one out or move it somewhere else, it can be done. Right. Yeah, and I've seen, you know, storybook trails, and sometimes they are done really beautifully and they stay, and then occasionally you encounter one where, like, you know, pages have come off or whatever, and, it, and so anyway, certainly there'll be lots of eyes on these because there's so many visitors to the park, but, you know, just, um, yeah, I can't wait to see it. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Josh, anything to you? Josh? Comment. Do you have a comment you wish to make? Oh, uh, it, it seems like a wonderful project, and, and it was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the other things that's exciting, I think it will help bring new clientele into the park as well. Once word of mouth gets out there, you may get some visitors that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Lindsay, anything? No, I just, I'm amazed at how wonderful <laughs> it is and how well thought out it is. And um, you guys put a lot of work in it, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, let me just say, I think this is fantastic. When I first heard about it, Rye Poetry Path, I know what the heck could that possibly be? <laughs> um, but I think right now, after seeing it, the presentation and knowing what it is, kind of reminds me of, of, of the uh, the placement in the sidewalks near the New York Public Library. You know, the, those brass plaques that are set in the sidewalks. That you, every time I, I go there, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And this is, is going to be like that. And I'm really pleased that our park has now evolved um, into a real artistic show place. And I think we can all be excited about that. You know, we, we've, we've had um, sculptures in the park. Of course, we've had music in the park. Last year, we had the painting on the wall for the LBGT uh, Q community. Um, and I hope we get more paintings. And now we have the spoken word. So I think, I think this all blends together and is making Rye Town Park a, a cultural center and brings the different aspects of the community together. And I think it's really terrific. So thank you. Thank you so Great much. Great presentation. I hope each and every one of you, your families, communities, friends, can visit and find something meaningful. In it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Amy. Um, <clears throat> next presentation is someone we're all familiar with, Barley Beach House. We have not. As I, I always manage to say something. Okay. We'll jump back to the, uh, in fact, let's do the presentation first, then we'll go on to the minutes. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. How are you? Thank you for having us today. Introduce yourselves. Yes. I don't, those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Chris Race. I'm one of the partners over at the Barley Beach House. I'm Bobby Harris, another one of the partners. And we're basically here today just basically to give you guys a quick presentation and an overview of uh, last season and what we have up and coming this season. We're very excited for this season. Uh, we have a lot of fun new stuff that we're going to be trying out. And it's our first year that we're going into the season really excited without uh, any major renovations or craziness going on. Um, or anything that we really have to adapt to. So we're coming into a year now where we've worked with staff and we're, you know, we're, we're working with the same people again that we could trust and rely on. And uh, we've gone through our growing pains now and we think that we have a lot of good things ahead of us. So we're looking to stay as far ahead as the season as we possibly can and make it one of the best seasons yet to come. This was the first winter that we've been open all winter every day um, and it was as we expected it was you know it was slow but we plan on going forward that any restaurant there has been open all well, winter 
we, we were open for one winter. One, no, one part of it. But one we shut down because of COVID, or we had to right. shut down because of construction, renovation. So it's it's it's, it's nice to be able to it, it's have a, this time to plan. It's a relief on us to know that we could accept the fact that we're going to be open every day of the week, seven days a week, even through the winter at this point. So we plan on building off that, building off this winter, using the summer to drive us through next winter and, and team up with as many good people and, and events that we can do in the off season to kind of drive us through the season and move forward. All right, so, oop. So just part of this presentation is that on the yearly basis, we have to go through any uniform changes and menu changes with you guys. So the menu that we're looking at here is, is for the most part, what the menu is going to look like for the season. It's basically just all around food that uh, pretty much we think that anybody can enjoy. It's not too seafood heavy. It's not all fried food. It's got the variety of the salads, the sandwiches, and it's got the perks of having the seafood and all the other good stuff that everybody likes at our restaurant on a regular basis. The pretzels, we're, we're looking at, you know, doing a couple more seafood items, adding some cheese boards or, you know, uh, farm to table boards, stuff like that, more sharing plates. And we plan on running more specials throughout the season this year when we get to the, all the event stuff, you'll see we have stuff planned for, you know, happy hour events, Kentucky Derby, all that good stuff. I don't see one thing on this menu. No pizza. So that was one of the things that we had a conversation about. We ran the pizza last year. It went well. People liked it. We had a bunch of pizzas. But we decided that that would be something that we do more of a special on. We do more flatbread versions. And we have the mobile pizza oven, so that will be coming in and out throughout the course of the season. It's just uh, it, it was one of those items that was hard to do all the time when we're trying to do everything else. We're not pizza places. <laughs> The North, Gate ha the, the North Gate has a built-in pizza oven, which will be getting used this year. And we also have a mobile pizza oven that we're going to be use, using this year, too. That's kind of why we didn't really feel the need for it to be 24-7 in the restaurant. This one, right? I don't want to hit the wrong button again. Oh. All right. So getting ahead of the season, uh, this is probably as far as we've ever been getting it ahead of our season in the summers. So what you're looking at now is basically from May to September. Um, and this this will be posted up on our website after we finalize everything, but this is pretty much at this point finalized. We have, I could run down it really quick for you guys, you know, stuff like Kentucky Derby is gonna be an in-house uh, event that we'll be doing. We'll be doing happy hour specials, running uh, food specials. We actually have a character artist coming in that'll be drawing people throughout the course of the Kentucky Derby, you know, with funny hats and stuff, just kind of doing stuff to bring, uh, you know, people together, have a little bit more activities at the bar. Uh, we have a Mother's Day brunch going on. We'll be doing half off uh, champagne and some, maybe a prefix menu. We're gonna be bringing in photographers to take family pictures. There's a couple bigger events that we're looking at doing this year, uh, which come in a couple later slides, but, so I'll skip those ones for now, but, the Sudden Sound Craft Beer Fest will be one of them. Uh, the Sunset Beach Dinners that we're, you'll see here, it looks a little bit repetitive. From Memorial Day to Labor Day, every Friday, due to the fireworks, we constantly run into an issue where we have an overflow of people that just walk to the restaurant that want a reservation, but we don't have tables, and they're waiting an hour and a half, two hours for tables. So one of the things that we'll be proposing to you guys today are these Sunset Beach Dinners. The Beach Deck, for those of you who are not familiar, or unfamiliar with uh, the location, we dropped the Beach Deck down on the beach last year. That fits about, that seats about 60 people. So we're trying to utilize that Beach Deck a little bit more on Fridays with the overflow where we can offer like a $25 buffet for people who want to come and eat and, and have a place to sit and watch the fireworks and not have to feel forced off the table. So we're, we plan on doing that every Friday when there's fireworks and then the last Friday of every month just to change it up We were going to do a pig roast down there So the general theme of the sunset beach dinners would be tropical island themed food and we'll have music and obviously the fireworks show and let people hang out down there with your approval um, Again this this whole promo calendar is basically the whole 
season, so then there's big league volleyball. We plan on doing our Rosé and Rye event, which we did last year, which was great. There's a, a bunch of other happy hour stuff in here, uh, like National Bourbon Day, National Margarita Day, um, so on and so forth. So the basically, I'm going to just keep going. This will be again. This will be posted to our website, so people, if they, they want to see what's going on, we'll, we'll uh, they'll be able to pull it up whenever they want to see what we have going on. You know, let, let me interrupt one second, Debbie. It is a possible on our website to have a link to the Barley Beach House. So when people go I around, believe we do. We do? Okay, yeah. good. I'm, I'm glad I didn't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the Sunset Beach Dinners, uh, this would be from Memorial Day to Labor Day, just as I was explaining before, we were looking to utilize our beach deck a little bit more with just uh, buffet seating down there for dinner service and let people sit there throughout the fireworks. So this is just basically the schedule for the Sunset Beach dinner. And again, the last last Friday of every month, we're just gonna mix in a, a pig roast just to kind of change up the menu. These are some of the bigger events that we plan on uh, getting approval for this year. One of them that, the first one is the Easter brunch. It wasn't on the first promo schedule that you just saw because it didn't go back to April. So Easter brunch, we're open now. Saturday and Sundays, we are doing brunch now if for people who want to just walk in or make a reservation for it. Saturday, the day before Easter, we plan on getting about 2,000 Easter eggs, and we're hoping to use an area in the park where we can put the Easter eggs out and offer families to come down with their kids for an Easter egg hunt around noon. The Easter Bunny will be coming by that day f to make a special presentation, to make a special visit. So we'll have photographers there to take family photos. And we're hoping that we could get approval just to have the kids run around the park and pick up Easter eggs. We'll also be offering just a quick in and out brunch for families that don't have the time to stay, that wanna do the hunt, uh, that wanna come in, eat real quick and leave, or again, they can make a reservation and have a seated brunch. Um, so that one's pretty straightforward. Suds on the Soundcraft Beer Festival, with your approval, we're looking to, to have a, a craft beer festival in the park. FDNY 343 charity event is a 9-11 charity event. For those of you who are familiar with our location, one of our managers, Candace, she's, she's been a big supporter of that foundation. And if you've ever met her, she's probably the nicest nicest person you'd ever meet in your life so <laughs> right so we want to so we want to kind of we, we want to put this event together for her and you know get make sure that she has a support that you know as much support as we could possibly give her summer kickoff party and Westchester wine walk uh, I have individual uh, little links for these so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it when we go through them and if you look to the right, Enormous Creative is actually our new marketing company that we're working with. They put this whole presentation together for us, so we're very excited to have them on board, too. This is just the Easter brunch. I, I picked a little location next to the store where I, I think there's enough trees and rocks to hide some Easter eggs. Um, so again, with your approval, we're just basically looking to put some Easter eggs out in the park, offer free photos with the Easter bunny, and a quick, quick brunch for families, something something quick, easy, and simple, and just family friendly uh, so everybody could be invited and have something to do. Suds on the Soundcraft Beer Festival. We're hoping to get approval May 14th. We're looking to do 50 different breweries, over 100 different tastings, live music, uh, band outside in the park, tickets ranging from 15 to $55, which would include DDs, food, um, we're trying to work with some local vendors, bringing some local vendors to the event to help support it. Um, that one. FDNY 343 ride, like I said, 9-11 charity. We're looking to do it on a Sunday, June 5th. We're trying to, we are trying to book Shalele Law, which is a big uh, policeman, fire, uh, fire department backed band. So with your approval, if we were able to do this event, we'd be going to the police department, the fire department, seeing if they would like to take part in this event. Basically, we're just gonna try to raise money for this foundation. Summer kickoff party, we're calling that our sponsorship party. Uh, we're looking to do this on June 25th. We have booked 
Polynesian dancers, Hawaiian dancers, fire spinners, sword swallers, ukulele players. And we're just basically, we're calling it our sponsor party because we're getting, uh, we're gonna have that day is where we bring all our sponsors in. They'll be giving away hats and sunglasses and coolers and, and just a whole bunch of fun stuff. And the dancers, what we're planning to do with them is give them a section on the beach next to our beach deck and they'll do two shows, one at three o'clock and one at six o'clock. They'll go down onto the sand and they'll do their shows on the sand and they'll come back up and they'll, they'll interact with the guests, they'll take pictures, um, just kind of walk around the store and hang out. A Couple of the sponsors that we're really excited for this year is, again, Enormous Creative. They're our new marketing team. They do, uh, they do a lot to the Chico's Markets, uh, X2O, uh, Captain Lawrence. So we feel like they're gonna be a great fit for us and they're gonna help get the word out there that we're here, we're around, and help us with all our images and, you know, and push the store and get us in the right direction to where we could uh, successfully hit our goals. And one that I'm personally very excited about is the local radio station, Peak 107. Uh, we've been talking about doing a bunch of stuff with them. We're trying to get them there to come down to all the events and to uh, broadcast live, whether it be from the beach deck or the back room or on the patio and stuff, and just kind of let everybody know what we have going on and, and bounce uh, local artists off. Um, they're gonna also help us find local artists to play. So we're very, very excited for to have them working with us also. Westchester Wine Walk, we did that last year. We thought it was uh, a success. We think it's, again, could be even bigger and even better this year. Again, the Peak is gonna, we're working with the Peak for them to be the main sponsor for this event. Reason is because they work with a lot of local artists. So we would do this event pretty much just how we did it last year, but the Peak is working on getting us like four local artists so that every hour on the hour during the course of the event, we have upcoming new and live music. So we're fingers crossed on that one that we get some good people to come out for that show. Uh, besides our events, this is basically our uniform. We're sticking with the same uniforms that uh, we did last summer. They might be blue or, or pink for the guys and girls, but we offer black too now and they're just lightweight clothing. So staff doesn't sweat in the summer. I know one of the big questions is gonna be about security for the beach deck and security for these events. I've been speaking with Ken over at Green Mountain Concert Services. They do the Capitol Theater. They specialize in large outdoor events or large concerts. They'll be, they're willing to work with us on all our events. They're, they're gonna basically be staffing our events uh, based upon how many ticket sales that we have and location of where we're gonna be sectioned off the park if we get approval for, for the events. Uh, they will have us insured and Rye Town Park additionally insured with, uh, with their company. And I think that's all I have. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, one more. The event parking is, uh, is one thing that we usually have an issue with, especially in the summer with uh, with the overflow for the, for the beach and the park. We're proposing that on a couple of the, the larger scale events that we just, uh, we could use the overflow parking space area. We're working with Uber and Lyft to reduce the amount of parking. We're gonna be give, uh, working with them to get discount codes and our market team will be putting something together to push parking to the Playland parking lot. But we do feel that, that we will need some additional parking for some of these events. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, comments? A question, uh, if, if I may. We looked at the menu, um, but I'd be curious to know what kind of price increases uh, you're going to have this year, what percentage price increases on your menu items? That's something that we talk about almost every day at work. Uh, the way it, it's going now, every, everything is, it's like hitting a moving target. We were talking the other day that lobster is $50 a pound. You know, how can you sell a lobster roll? We, we don't, we're afraid to, you know, to look like we're gouging people. That's why you'll see it on our menu is market price. But what you see here with the, the menu that you see there has been adjusted to the current pricing 
which we're not adding. A lot of places now, they're adding the 3% for the credit card uh, charges. We're not gonna do that. You know, we're, we're basically just looking at our margins and, and just trying to stay within a window that we would do on a regular basis. Yeah, it's not a blanket increase. It's, you know, individual items. Some have increases, some don't. And we're really just passing along, you know, what we're gonna hit with. So um, we think it's more than fair. We looked at competitors and there's nothing out of line there. At all. I don't think. Well, listen, if the prices are wrong, they're too high, <laughs> you won't sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's called supply and demand. I know we're all we're all in that situation. Yeah, it's, right. it's, right. it's like hitting a moving target right now. I mean, we ran into so many issues last year with just items being out of stock, and you know, one item that's not on our menu right now is the calamari. We had such an issue last year with calamari because the the, the calamari that we were ordering you couldn't get it. So then they start sending you something else, and it's not as good, or it's too expensive, or it's not the right kind, so we took it off the menu just because it was such a, a hassle from last year, and we didn't want to run into that again. So again, it's just it's one of those things. It's constantly moving. You can't, constantly buy, you can't buy an avocado right now because of, you know, stuff that's going on outside. So it's, you know, the menu just needs to kind of change when it needs to change. So um, hopefully, you guys won't feel it's you know too pricey or anything. We don't certainly don't. No, I don't. I don't think we want to have your hands in. in, in our hands in your pockets with regard to this. You know, we keep saying over and over again, your success is our success. Yeah. So we want you to be successful. And the way you'll do that is by right pricing it. Yeah. Obviously, market conditions change from time to time. You gotta have to roll with it. Yeah. Jason? Yeah, just a quick question because, I mean, as you can see, I'm in acting commission. So I, you know, I've been at meetings sporadically over the past, but if I remember correctly, when it was originally being set up, the beach deck, there was a carve out where the alcohol was able to be served. Has, has that changed or is that? No, that does not change. We have a, a gated area where um, you know, we're patrolling the area, we're making sure it's contained in that specific area. So how will that work with the Friday, with the sunset dinners? It would be within that contained, fenced in area. It would be within that area? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, it, so I'm just thinking about families. So I mean, children are still allowed there, but no one's allowed to leave that area no with the... Drink. Oh, sorry. Thank you. No one's allowed to leave that area with a drink. Nobody's, you know, it's it's a contained area. It's a, okay. You know, fenced in. I don't think I don't recall we've had any complaints about that. Am I correct? No. Just, yeah. Are you turning away people on Friday? Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know what? We, we try not. To I, on a busy Friday night, you know, like Chris said, it, it, there's an hour and a half wait. You know, we're, and we're just trying to. Uh, the deck wasn't open last, so that's kind of what we're proposing is we want to be able to take those people and have that beach barbecue food. Like, so if you're really there for just for the fireworks or if you're there to be outside and you just want to be outside, I, I wouldn't want to wait an hour and a half. So um, we just want to be able to offer them an alternative that, you know, an immediate meal. You know, I know I have two kids and my kids are not waiting an hour and a half. We don't know. Sure, yeah. We don't know. They can walk down to the beach and, you know, your feet in the sand. Again, that would be buffet style. So we would have a menu and they would pay one price. They would walk down to the beach and sit there. And there's a, there's a second kitchen downstairs that we can serve for the food. So. Um, I, I just wanted to say um, I appreciate this presentation. You guys are enthusiastic every year. And I'm like, gosh, maybe they're not going to come back. Like the construction disaster, COVID, you know, and you got, you really. Um, come back with great ideas every year, and it's um, so exciting. And I think the community loves loves having you at the park. Um, I remember drafting our contract and having community input, and a concern being noise. Um, so just to touch, uh, like the events and the um, beach deck. Did the beach deck act, operate last year? It did. Yeah, we had. Again, it's always smaller events, so to the public, I just want to say, you know, you haven't heard us, we haven't gotten a complaint. It's it's a, it's one guy with an acoustic guitar during the day. You know, we're not looking to throw big ragers at night or anything or disturb the public in any way. Okay. Um, we had um, a tacos and tequila night where we, you sampled several different varieties of tequila with a, a nice, you know, Mexican buffet. Um, the rosé event was, you know, 
10 different types of rosé wine with a huge charcuterie board and you know just the, they're a little more upscale events nothing uh nothing that should disturb the public i hope sure um with the friday night fireworks sorry i had just got it down some notes yeah. um would that is that a potential for noise issues how late does that go the fireworks will definitely be louder than us <laughs> we're, we're like we're not even i don't think we're planning on even having any kind of additional music or any additional noise it's just extra seating down on the beach deck so, yeah. so i mean i said it at the last meeting i think but if you saw the ride the westchester calendar or whatever that thing was you got in the mail with the picture of the beach deck on doesn't the that look nice yeah it looked, i mean it looks yeah it's like beautiful really tropical. And that went out to that went out to the whole county so that's the great county, right. people. um but okay so yes so the noise issues um I guess, Debbie, this might be a question for you. We, in our budget, have an aggressive facility rental proposition of $70,000, I think, this year. Oh, for the for this year, yeah. Yeah, and I guess my concern is, does this impact interest in facility rentals? The, it's an aggressive event schedule, I appreciate it. I, but, uh, you know, if, if we're trying to, if we're expecting that kind of revenue for the facilities rentals, I don't think we can, pardon me, I think this is loud. Um, I wouldn't anticipate that an event on the sand is going to discourage somebody who wants to have a party in either one of the beach pavilions. Yeah. Okay. Um, if anything, it might actually be an inducement because they don't have to hire music. It will be playing. Mm -hmm. um, but I would, uh, I, I think we'll know a whole lot more after this summer because we have also been in COVID right. mode for the last two seasons. Two seasons ago, there were no rentals whatsoever. Last season, they were beginning to come back. Right. And we expect that this season, we will really get a handle on what the new normal mm -hmm. looks like. This yeah. might even bring new people to the beach, these events. I think it's absolutely wonderful and I already have May 14th marked down <laughs> on my calendar. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I think this will actually kind of show people who aren't in the area who, or who normally wouldn't use the beach, you know, what we have to offer. And it may, like Debbie said, entice some people to um, go there. I also, I mean, this is fantastic. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I, the only, yes, I did have uh, just a comment on I agree, Suds on the Sound Craft Beer Festival sounds like the place I want to be. I am worried about our the local laws with respect to alcohol in the park, and I know there was a big, go ahead. We, will be a permit that we pull through yeah, the liquor we, authority. We're already working on a one day, we're already working on a one day event license with our liquor attorney. Okay, um, great. I mean, I guess the only, the only thing I think about with respect to like these daytime events in the park outside of the restaurant just because there are, you know, a good number of them proposed for the summer, I just think about like the poetry path that we just heard about, like the, you know, the person who wants to come on Sunday to walk around and I read the sycamore tree poem and the beer. Like I'm just trying to put it all together and make sure everybody has opportunity to enjoy the park. Um, so just a concern. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, I'm hoping that those people kind of want to join whatever oh. song <laughs> to be honest. I hope they want to read some poetry yeah, and they're excited about the poetry oh. band, so. yeah. We can have a poetry reading on the beach too. Absolutely. Yeah. Read the read you. the poems. With Bring the, the poet in. Bring the poet laureate in. Yeah, yeah, with the wind in. No. We're looking to utilize the beach deck as much as we possibly can this year. So I think we'll everything a whole new meeting. <laughs> 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 I, I turn into limericks at that point. You know, I think it all. I think it all. It all can work together. You know, activity on the beach. The park is really big. You do have people who want to, who you know, might want to use the poetry path, and other people relax on the beach. And I don't. I don't see that there's any any conflict. If we do get conflicts of some kind, we'll deal with it. We'll figure it out. I mean, I'm just looking at this event schedule, and you guys put a lot of work into it and a lot of thought into it, and it really kind of brings a whole sense of excitement to the park. Mm -hmm. 
and kind of entices people and entices people from all over who normally wouldn't come to the park to use it. Um, it's it's exciting, and you guys like left no stone unturned as far as like um, collaborating with Uber and Lyft. I think that's fantastic. It not only helps with the parking situation, but it encourages people to um, enjoy the park responsibly. <laughs> um, it's it's very impressive, and I I think it's fantastic. So. Thank you. Yeah. I see. By the way, I see we, we have volleyball on Mondays. I mean, that's been our is this the, the regular Monday volleyball? Yeah, that's that just you the put regular in there? Monday volleyball. We work with our with our promo schedule, so we know everything that's going on. Right. The beach that will be open, so we know to keep it open and be extra. I think that'll be a boon for the volleyballers. Well, the, surprisingly, because last year we had the beach deck down there, they still like to come upstairs in between the games. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, it'll, it'll catch on. All right, good. So, um, if, if there are no further comments, I don't know, is the public allowed to make a comment or friends of Right Town Park or anybody in the audience? Sure, absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, well, uh, okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'm bringing a bunch of moms from Milton to Barley tomorrow right. night, and we are gonna. Um, Diana, introduce yourself for the. Oh, sorry, I'm Diana Page. I'm the president of Barley. I think I met you. I'm the uh, president of the Friends of Right Town Park. And so, with respect to Barley, we're really excited about you guys um, and COVID ending and I'm sort of reinvigorating these. Get closer to the microphone. Okay. Um, and reinvigorating the sort of Wine Wednesday thing that I started, um, we, we did a couple of years ago before COVID. Um, we also have in probably mid April, last fall, November, we planted about 22,000 daffodils in the park. So, you know, we expect an ocean of these beautiful daffodils, which hopefully will draw people not only to the park, but to your restaurant. And of course, um, I just wanted to extend my gratitude to Amy for moving mountains on this poetry path. Um, Jamie, Russ, and I were part of the team that helped select the poems. And uh, all of these things, I hope, will not only bring people to the park, but will bring people to Barley, and we all will succeed. We can so. put an advertisement for the poetry path in the Barley Beach House. So can, people coming to dinner can yeah. know that it's there. For sure, and I think too, like we have a pretty active Instagram, um, which we are trying to, you know, support um, events in the park and and bring people there and publicize them and, and really get people excited. So, um, a lot of great things. We're excited. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a resolution uh, to approve the. Um, the uh, uniforms, menu, and the pro promotional calendar. Uh, may I have a motion and a second? I'll make the motion. Second. Any further discussion? If not, uh, Debbie, please call the roll. Commissioner Cohn? Yes. Commissioner Jackson? An enthusiastic yes. <laughs> Commissioner Hurd? Yes. Acting Commissioner Klein? Yes. President Zuckerman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, jumping back, uh, adoption of the minutes of October 19th and January 18th, October 19th of 21, and January 18th of 22. May I have a motion and a second? I'll sorry. I'll second. Uh, if there are no further comments, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was not present for one of those meetings, so. But you've read the minutes. I, I I am agreeing with respect to the meeting that I attended, but I can't vote on the other. Did you? Well, you can if you viewed the meeting. Or, or, or approval? Uh, I, no, I was not at the meeting of October 19th. Okay. Okay, so note, absent. Abstain. So you're, you're abstaining from the October. I am, I am abstaining. Okay, thank you, Josh. Um, <clears throat> uh, next resolution is regarding the geospatial mapping of the beach and the park. Let me briefly go over um, exactly what this is for. 
Uh, a memo had been sent to the commissioners, but uh, so the public is aware. Uh, the um, process of addressing the damage wrought by Tropical Storm Ida has brought us into uh, biweekly consultation with FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security um, as we identified uh, the areas of damage. Um, it became clear um, by staff reports and observations that we've lost uh, 10 to 12 feet of shoreline possibly and a considerable amount of sand. Uh, but in order to identify and get a true scope of work, we have to gauge what the damage is. The last time we had a topographical survey of the park was in 2017, which I would say we have used consistently every time we've done a, um, any kind of capital work, any time we've had to get um, approvals, permits, we've used that extensively. Um, and honestly, the only way for us to move forward with uh, FEMA and DHSES support is to have a topographical flyover of the beach. Um, in addition, uh, the, the marginal cost for surveying the rest of the park, because it's, it'll be the same plane ride, is um, I believe an additional $1,800. Um, and um, therefore it's our recommendation that it's time we do a full flyover and uh, FEMA will support 75% of that portion of the flyover that is deemed directly related to the areas of damage that we've identified, including the entire beach. All right. Uh, and this is related to the next item on the agenda, which is for uh, uh, some emergency restoration. So this is the resolution for approval of the flyover uh, at a total cost of $5,840. Um, any questions before we go on? The, the not to exceed amount, that does not include the 70% covered by FEMA. This Correct. Is, okay. No, that's the total amount. That's the total that's amount. That's the total amount. FEMA yeah. will, will pay 75% of that. Or actually, they will pay the amount attributed to flying over the damaged areas, which is all of the beach. It's roughly $3,000 yeah. of the 58 Fantastic. will be covered by, by FEMA. So I have re received written confirmation from both FEMA and the Department of DHSES. I will believe it when the money arrives. <laughs> I... May I have a motion and a second? I'll make the motion. So, uh, Debbie, call the roll, please. Commissioner Hurd? Yes. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Commissioner Cohn? Yes. Acting Commissioner Klein? Yes. President Zuckerman? Yes. Thank you. Uh, next resolution is uh, deals with uh, emergency repairs to the uh, promenade, what they call, what FEMA calls uh, temporary emergency protective measures to ensure the safety of the park's promenade. Uh, and this is also directly related to Tropical Storm Ida and the, uh, the staff has determined where the damage is and there are maps uh, attached to the resolution and a description of the work and um, this is you're going to put it up there Deb? And this is, this is the first step because the next step would be permanent mitigation uh, to prevent it in the future. And once again, all of this will be paid for uh, if approved by uh, a grant of 75% from FEMA. And uh, I, I, I 
believe that all of our communities are dealing with FEMA on this. Uh, I, the village of Rybrook and I believe the city of Rye, Josh and I have had some previous conversations because uh, they are very difficult to deal with. As an example, I think, was it, is Isaiah the one with the trees? Yes. Yeah, yeah. it's Isaiah. Pardon me? Isaiah, yes. I think it's Isaiah. Is that, yes. Yes. That storm. <laughs> that storm. Uh, that storm. Um, they actually asked us for the uh, GIS coordinates for every tree, every tree that we're claiming was had been caused, uh, had damaged by Isaias. So uh, that's, that's how technical it gets. Debbie mentioned she has a call every Friday with FEMA and DHSES going over all of these things in minute detail. And uh, I'm glad she's on the call and not me. So if you got it, oh, there, there's the map up there. So this map features, um, it, it gives us a, a, a pretty good view of the impact that the water had on Rytown Park in that um, water came in through from Oakland Beach uh, from the neighborhood. It washed over the, um, the overflow parking area through the, the middle pond path, which is indicated by the number one. Um, into the pond, out of the pond, and along the culvert, above ground and below ground. And of course, below ground was completely inadequate, completely washed out that area of the lawn, and across the, hit the promenade, removed layers of stone dust, which were covering and making the path smooth so that people could walk along it revealing the foundation which was built in 1904 and then down onto the beach where it washed all kinds of sand right out to the sound. So the emergency protective measures that we have identified uh, go to making the park safe for park users which will start using the park in really greater numbers, of course they never stop, but in greater numbers in the spring. So what we are proposing to do is, um, with the assistance uh, and support of FEMA, is that we will be putting um, emergency surfacing for the middle pond path, number one, and the um, promenade area, number that area. So those are, those are the two areas that we really can't wait for, um, for further development of capital work. Um, I would say that there are a number of other areas of damage. I mentioned the culvert, for example. Uh, we wanna make sure that this doesn't happen over and over with every storm. Um, and so we, um, about five of our projects are candidates for mitigation, which will also receive support from FEMA. And so those are being developed right now, but of course that will take some time. Um, so while we are doing mitigation planning, and we'll discuss that more at further meetings, we need to take immediate action to make sure that the, uh, the, the footpaths that are used actively are safe. Thank you. No, so Just like to, if, if, if I may. Sure. Uh, of dealing with FEMA, I think it's important as we do this to understand that although we may think that FEMA should ultimately pay its share, um, it, it's there's a difficult a, a difficult path of proof that. I guess Debbie has volunteered to follow. And Debbie, we <laughs> Volunteers is a good word, Josh. We appreciate your volunteering. Yeah. But, but... It makes it all worthwhile. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how certain we can be of FEMA funding. Well, right now, from 
well, Debbie can speak for herself, but they, they, have, they have not pushed back in terms of you know, saying, oh, no, you can't do this, as far as I know. Debbie, you can speak to that. Well, I, I suspect, based on what Josh has said, that the um, officials in the city of Rye are dealing with the same level of ridiculous pushback from Tropical Storm Isais. And all of the further documentation and the questioning of projects that we had discussed thoroughly and repeatedly with that staff that suddenly everything's being questioned. I feel your pain. Um, I can say that um, you know, we're working really closely with uh, the representatives from Homeland Security who are helping walk us through this and we're, we're making it through. And there's nothing that we are going forward uh, that doesn't have a, a written trail of confirmation from FEMA. That's all I can do. Yeah, I think that we need to clear up. When we say Homeland Security, it's New York State Homeland Correct. Security. New York State Department of Homeland Security. Which acts as the agent for FEMA in, in these things. So kind of like the agent. I can't guarantee that until I see the mitigation and until I know that they. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm not clear on how the process works. Yeah. So, Emily, Emily, the, right now we're talking about emergency protective measures. Right. Okay. The next step will be mitigation. We're not doing mitigation on, for example, the culvert now, but that may be part of the mitigation to prevent it from happening in the future. So that's a separate step than than what we're doing now. To be honest with you, what we are doing right now, what we are proposing that we support tonight, yep. we would do anyway, whether FEMA was paying for it or not, because it's to make... Fixing the paths. Right. Okay. Making it safe. It's making... So, tell me about the culvert then. How does that come into play here? Um, so there's nothing we're doing, we're voting on tonight with regard with to the culvert. The culvert. Okay, it's it. going, if it rains, buckets tomorrow, it will overflow just the way it does every time it right. storms. But we're not addressing that. It's not a public safety issue. Okay. So that's not what we're addressing. So, and I'm sorry, just to add a little more and get deeper into the weeds. Um, when you talk about, because temporary protective measures, you're talking about replacing parts of the pathway. That'll be a permanent replacement, correct? The, the mitigation for the path will include drainage mm -hmm. and other methods that our engineers will develop so that the next time we get a, a tropical storm Ida, we don't lose all of our stone dust and there we go again, we have to put it back. So, okay, so in essence, we're not doing this project and then in a couple of years saying we have to redress it. This is a... We're, we're doing this now knowing that we're going to we're going to do the best we can with the emergency protective measures, including item four, mm -hmm. um, item three, item four, item four. Thank yeah. you, item four. Um, so that if we get a big storm, yeah, we are not starting from square one again. And to also assist with the mitigate any future mitigation measures. Fut I can't predict what the engineers are going to come up with for their mitigation. I think there's. They're still working on what that so is. The potential is though, that could, like, I mean, the drainage may be under the path that we're fixing right now. Yes. And we'll have to tear it up. And or to the it. side. Or to the side, right. Got it. Okay. Um, anything else? Further questions? If not, um, <clears throat> may I have a motion and a second? Oh, by the way. We, we missed one part of this. Uh, so Debbie got uh, three, I guess Vic actually got them, three, uh, three bids, Formal estimates bids. To, uh, to do the work. And the lowest responsible bidder was MTS, which was, happened to be the firm that did the seawall. The seawall right? and they, did a great job. they did a great job and their estimate was about $10,000 less than the highest estimate, and the middle estimate came right in the middle. 
So. NCS is a female-owned company, right? Yes. Yeah. So. Can make a motion. Second. Second. Debbie, call the roll, please. Commissioner Jackson. Yes. Commissioner Hurd. Yes. Commissioner Cohn. Yes. Acting Commissioner Klein. Yes. President Zuckerman. Yes. Thank you, and now the fun part. Uh, we're going to deal with the budget. First, we're gonna deal with the uh, implementation of the beach and parking fees for the 2022 season. Um, we had this discussion at the last meeting, and uh, as a result of that meeting, the fees were revised Debbie, correct me. Um, basically, the permit fees were revised uh, approximately 7% across the board, and the senior fee, the senior resident permit remained the same. The open water swimming permit was increased to $70, and that's basically where we are. Am I correct? Yeah, also the, um, uh, the beach only fees have been adjusted as well, 7%. Okay. So, um, before we pass the budget, we have to pass the permit, f the fee schedule for next year. Uh, are there any comments on that? We've gone through it a yes, couple of times. Gary, if I, if, if I may, we, we aren't touching the non-resident daily fees and i understand there's a logistical problem attached to that having to do with the ability to give change but we may not be able to do the, that tonight and i wouldn't want that to stand in the way of our adopting the other fees but i would like us to commit to examine how we might raise those fees because it it's it seems counterintuitive to be raising our permit fees the way we are um, and not looking at least the non-resident daily fees. I do remember uh, uh, Mayor Falanca's concerns with raising the resident daily fees, and I'm not proposing we touch those, but I am proposing we look hard at non-resident. We could do that, and unlike the permit fees, the daily fees, once we figure out the logistics of it all, we can raise the daily fees uh, accordingly. We can raise those mid-year if we need to, once the logistics are worked out, if we so decide. We can, we can pass an amended fee schedule if that's the desire of the commission. Understood. I actually concur with Mayor Cohn on the non-resident fee. Um, I think we should take a look at it at some point in the future. Yeah. We will. I think right now, with what Mayor Cohn was referring to was with logistics, because uh, he had sent an email to Debbie uh, asking that that question, and Debbie explained the logistics of it. You do it better than I do. The um, the, the vast majority of non-residents, um, possibly all of them, buy their daily beach admission tickets via the kiosks. Mm -hmm. The kiosk is designed so that it does not give change. Now we post that information on the kiosk and there are a, con a steady stream of people who don't read the sign. They put money in and they're looking for change. Um, and so there's a stream of people heading for Russell Gold, wherever he happens to be, um, complaining about that, and he makes it, he, he works with them on that, as does um, head park attendant um, uh, Jose Oliveros. Uh, we are reducing our park attendant headcount this year by 20% because, well, I, I can go into the because if you need to. Um, so when people, if we increase the prices of daily fees, there will be a certain learning curve of people lining up at the kiosk 
who need to learn what's going on. We have to figure out the fee so that we don't find ourselves constantly turning around and trying to make change out of cash, which we've made a policy of not holding in people's hands, but rather it goes into a machine with a record, it comes out of the machine with a record, it goes directly into the bank with a record. So the logistics of how we would go about what's the right price point for that increase, we have to wrap our heads around how, how we do that. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's impossible, we have to think it through. Um, it is the, now the, 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 um, the ticket booths certainly take credit cards we have not, we've made a policy of not accepting cash at the ticket booths. So that's, for, for people using credit cards, that's certainly a valve. And also with the introduction of the um, Verizon telephone signal, we will reintroduce our phone app, MPay to Park, which sells beach admission as well. And so that may be an option for us as well, that people can buy their, they can pull out their phones and buy their beach tickets that way. Great. So is the concern that beachgoers won't have exact change? Right. And that's why these fees are like five, 10, 20, 25. Yes. Yeah. So if you raise it 7%, I mean, you don't want to charge like $7.63. Right. You don't want to add any change. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we'll work on that. The main thing is <clears throat> we want to, the, the, the most important thing here is that we approve the fee structure so that we can sell our permits now right. at the current structure. They don't have, when, when do we, the daily rates go into effect? Uh, Memorial May? Day. Memorial Day. So we can, any t we can even, forgetting raising it in the summer, we have between now and Memorial Day to see what sure. we could do about the daily rates. Is there that high a percentage of people who actually pay cash versus using a credit card? Or? Fewer and fewer, thank goodness. Uh, uh, f five years ago, 90% cash. Really? And now, last year, I believe we were at about 17% cash. Okay. So there is the possibility at some point of going cashless completely on this. Boy. Russell, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, look, the, um, yeah, um, Commissioner Klein, that, that's, the, that's the goal, absolutely. Um, and yet with uh, people that insist on using cash, you know, they, they can still use cash, but it has to go, in the, in, it has to go into one of the pay stations. We're not, right. we're, we've eliminated all cash transactions between human beings so that we have, you know, we have 100%, you know, accountability as far as the movement of cash. Um, and, you know, non-residents um, that are buying daily, you know, daily um, beach transactions, uh, beach passes, they can, they can also use, you, know, you can use their cards in the kiosks. They don't have to use cash, but the, the goal, you know, for me, as far as I'm concerned, is to eliminate cash altogether. And as Debbie just described, we are, we're, we're moving swiftly along, swiftly in that direction, and I'm real happy about that. And, and, and possibly next year, we'll introduce Jeff Binder's favorite form of currency. Bit what? Bitcoin? Bitcoin. No, actually, it's Ethereum, <laughs> but it's crypto. <laughs> Love it. I think we should install it at all the kiosks. <laughs> Can we pay public employees in crypto? On a side note, when Amy yeah. was doing her presentation with the QR codes, I was thinking about the Super Bowl, and did anybody I run up this. to the TV to yeah. have a QR code for the, anyway. Yeah, in answer to your yeah. excuse me, in answer to your question, Mayor Adams in New York gets paid in, in crypto. Really? That's right. Okay. I know there are laws that you have to have a certain amount of money set aside to pay. That's oh. interesting. Um, well, I think that's a great solution with respect to the um, permits and fees that we commit to looking at that before Memorial Day um, so that we can accommodate that. Um, All right. Change if, if you think it makes sense. Well, we will. All right. Um, may I have a motion and a second to approve the uh, park fees? I'll move. 
Thank you. Second? Second. And Debbie, for the next iteration, instead of calling it permit fees on the chart, just put fees because we have daily fees on that chart as well. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so uh, please call the roll. Commissioner Hurd? Yes. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Commissioner Cohn? Yep. Acting Commissioner Klein? Yes. President Zuckerman? Yes. Thank you. And now the Rye Town Park Draft Operating Budget. Uh, again, we went through this last month. Changes were made. Um, Debbie, just do you want to just highlight a couple of of the assumptions that that we're making in terms of you know both revenue and the expenses that we're looking at? So this is a, a net surplus budget um, of approximately $36,000. The major assumptions are that the uh, concessions, that's the restaurant and also the uh, water sports recreation concession are continuing to build loyal followings and are steadily earning strong results. Uh, it, is, it assumes that our facility rentals will be returning to pre-pandemic levels, uh, assisted not only by the public's ability to get out and meet one another again, um, but also by our new event booking software, which has been up and running, and we are beginning to book events so that it's easier to book events. Uh, we are we built in um, the assumption that we have a seven percent increase in um, our permit categories that are keeping pace or were keeping pace with the consumer price index until it moved again. Um, the elimination of credit card fee expenses uh, by uh, changing our policy and passing on those convenience fees to our customers who use credit cards. Um, a 6% um, escalation in salaries driven primarily by the labor shortage and the moving of minimum wage and, and uh, uh, inflation. 4% um, non-discretionary increase in benefits and a 14% uh, increase in administrative expenses. Thank you. Um, are there any Questions or comments on the budget? I, I do have a question I raised in email about the administrative fees. I understand that we go with a rule of 25% of town administrative fees, but I am curious to understand better, given changes in town staffing, that is greater staffing, and also greater town responsibilities outside of the park itself, whether that 25% is still correct. And I understand from some communication with Debbie that there may be some staff assistance that we're taking advantage of that's not apportioned that way, that is apportioned more generously to us. But I just got the sense that um, I got this, the sense that, that the e equation is kind of rough and ready, and I'd appreciate having more insight into it. Well, um, I think Debbie, Debbie can give you an overview, but if we want to get into specifics about personnel, we're going to have to go into executive session to discuss who does exactly, you know, 
what and what their compensation is. So I don't, we could do that at any time um, if you want to not vote on the budget. But if Deb, Debbie could give an overview of what um, exactly how, how that's figured out. Gary, I'm, I'm content uh, if so long as we agree that we'll, in the next couple of meetings, we'll succeed in doing that. And if an adjustment is necessary, we might make an adjustment. Presumably, one won't be necessary, but uh, I don't want to hold up the budget tonight so long as we can do that. All right. That's not a problem. We, we can also go over to, you know, uh, you, you and I and, and Debbie on a, on a Zoom call if you want to, to just discuss it preliminarily. I'm so happy I, to do that. Yeah. Okay. So with that, unless there are further questions, motion to approve the commission budget for 2022. So moved. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Debbie, please call the roll. Commissioner Cohn? Yes. Commissioner Jackson? Yes. Commissioner Hurd? Yes. Acting Commissioner Klein? Yes. President Zuckerman? Yes, thank you. And this may be the earliest we have ever adopted the park budget. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, yeah. Commissioners. Congratulations. <laughs> Let's shoot for before the year starts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we really yeah. want to do that? Do we want to be passing a budget in December? No. Okay. <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> we have enough going on. Considering what, what's going on in all of your lives yeah. in the month of December. Okay, be, before we adjourn, um, I just wanted to bring to your attention, uh, Debbie sent out a, a memo earlier today in fact, just before the meeting started regarding the, the status of the, uh, the wall between the uh, beach house, beach house, bathhouse and the, and the promenade where the showers are located. It is tremendously deteriorating. Uh, Debbie has some pictures. These were taken by Vic. Vic and Russ uh, had gone over it. Um, Right now, several spaces, I believe seven spaces are cordoned off. You can see the deterioration. And this is because of the crumbling facade? Yes, and also it's been exacerbated over time, particularly this season with the freeze and thaw over and over again. Uh, is there a proposed plan in now that you mention it <laughs> to address this because it is yeah alarming um, we had we had uh, I, I Debbie and I had asked uh, for a proposal last summer about it it was extremely expensive just to do a uh, just to look at it um, so I spoke to Gary Gian Francisco when I got the report, and he, he sent me an email, which I'll forward to the commission um, in a couple of minutes as soon as I put my finger on send. And he, he's suggesting basically the first thing we should do is to ensure protection of the public by coordinating both sides of the wall and posting the imminent danger of the failing wall which we've already started to do. The next steps would be to excavate pits uh, to visually determine the condition of the wall, have soil borings performed, and engage a geotech engineer to prepare a report based on the soil composition found and propose what mitigation is necessary to repair or replace the walls. Um, 
We can go further than that, but I think that's the first step. And um, uh, we will start that immediately. Uh, I don't think that the cost of the geotech will be expensive or the borings because our staff can do that. Um, I think the longer term problem is if the walls are as deteriorated as they seem to be and need replacement, um, there is not enough time to get any grant unless we can find an emergency grant to, to get that work done. So uh, one thing that we would have to decide as to whether we would want to replace the wall or, or we should somehow shore it up temporarily until we find a permanent solution. There are various sources that we can approach to, to get grant money, but um, I think the immediate problem is to make sure it's safe. And, and then we'll, we'll take it from there, determine the condition of the wall, and, and move, move from there. How, oh, how have we taken into account the historical nature of the building and the park itself? and how that would impact any renovation to kind of keep it? Well, I think at this point we're not, we're not talking about renovation, and I would think that because it's falling down, you know, anything that we would do would have to be commensurate with certain historical standards. standards. But, you know, this thing was built with brick and covered in stucco, and I would think that if you're going to replace it, you'd want to replace it with poured concrete. You might want to cover the concrete with stucco to make it uniform, but I don't, I don't think that uh, the kind of construction that you have there right now is, uh, you know, is going to be replicated. It would be fantastically expensive to do it. Um, can we just take the wall down? Yeah, if it's an emergency, absolutely. But then what do you do? Because on the other side, if, you, if you're standing on this side of the wall with the pictures where the showers are, right. and you take the wall down, you have like a 12 foot drop. So you it's have to. High. Yeah, I'll, I'll go switch the picture yeah, but when you go back to the I recall that the elevation, but I didn't remember it was that high. Emily, this wall is also attached to the bathhouse. So um, if it goes, it may take a little piece of the bathhouse. Bath also, if you, um, if you notice, um, there's a, a significant change in elevation. So part of what that wall is doing is holding up the ground. Retaining no, it's holding up the earth. No, that's so, what she means. It yeah, is a yeah, retaining yeah, wall. Uh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. So it is we, we, we have to look at this very seriously. Um, it looks better. <laughs> well, I suspect, and I'm, I'm just suspecting, I don't know for sure, that part of the damage has probably been caused by the showers the there, water, yeah. in there. And I know that the friends have donated new sh a new shower, which will replace that. And whatever we, thank you, Diana, yes, wow. two of them. <laughs> and and, and the, they're those stand-up nice showers. But... I think before we install those showers, we really need to understand what we're going to do with the wall. Yeah. Actually, Gary, I, Gary, I just have to say that the it's it's my opinion that the showers that the showers play have played no role in in this in the in the deterioration of the wall. Russ, it, because they're they're justified down by the path, and they're and they're, and the, the water sprays away from the wall. It's just. All right. I don't. I don't know that we need to argue about whether it does. I said I suspect that. I could be wrong. Uh, I'm neither an engineer nor a plumber. Um, but uh, I think that you know the first step is examining what the problem is and how serious the problem is. Um, you know, we may get lucky and somebody may the, you know the uh, a geotech may examine and say the footings are fine. You got to replace this, so it might not be. I'm suspecting that we're going to need more of a replacement than yeah. than just fixing it up. I mean, this is just 
alarming to see kind of piece by piece just because and again I come back to the park's gorgeous I mean it, it has that historical kind of dated but in a good way um, aesthetic to it and I'm looking at the wall and I'm almost wondering what else is kind of deteriorating this way because you yeah <laughs> I mean it, well exactly but I, you know I just I, we're kind of in a bind at this point where it's almost impossible to save and I just would we're, be fearful that we would get into that position with well, look, the tower we building have been, bathhouses we have been replacing the deteriorated elements in the ta in the park mm -hmm. for the last several years yeah. the last one you know, we're, we're already talking about doing the roofs on the pavilion, which have been deteriorated. You know, we, we've done the, the seawall, which was not essentially knocked down. We've got the new ramps up. We're doing the, the interior of the bathhouse. Uh, and um, step by step, yeah. you know, obviously we don't have the money to do everything at one time. You know, neither the town nor the city is funding this without grants. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll work on it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we've all been looking at this wall for years. I remember walking, I think Diana, we were walking with Jamie and, and the, the friends of Rytown Park mentioned, what can we do about with this wall? Mm -hmm. You know, this is you know, like, it's so yeah, obvious. Cry, Gary. That wall yeah. I know, everything yeah. about it is so sad. Yeah. I, I also think like, it, you know, I remember, I mean, first of all, I just want to say the park has done a great job of trying to update what we can over the past few years in a, in a way that I think no park administration has done for a long time, which is why we are where we are. But, um, you know, I think we've committed to, especially like I know this tiny little ticket booth, but by stuccoing that building, you know, we are committed to, I think, consistently drawing that architectural theme across the park as we renovate this wall. Um, but things like, you know, I know we've looked at the gardens in front of, or the flowers in front of this wall, in front of the tower building on several different occasions while I've been on the commission. And if the darn thing wasn't so ugly and falling apart, like maybe we wouldn't need, you know, flowers to cover it up. I just feel like let's, let's do things right. Um, as we do them. And I think that's something that this commission has been doing and I appreciate that. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to acknowledge the Friends of Right Town Park. Um, I always think that everybody knows because I know how fantastic they are. Um, Diana has been working on this Instagram account that is just incredible. And what is it, Diana? It's Friends of Right Town Park? It's Friends of Right Town Park, yep. And it's um, a combination of sort of trumpeting what's in the park and interviews with people that I meet in the park and interviews with people who have stories to tell about the park and great things that happen in the present and in the past, like the, the Sandy Hook post at the yeah. end of the year and the big celebration, well, not celebration, but the big sort of day of healing that took place there. Um, it's really extraordinary. Yeah, so everybody, we should all be following that Instagram <laughs> feed. Um, but also, you know, the showers, I know, um, I know how much work you guys do and it's so special to us commissioners to have your support. And mm -hmm. so thank you. So let's figure out the wall so we can get those showers in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess Gary, you're raising this just as an FYI. This is yeah, online. yeah, because this this is recent. This happened this week in terms of uh, what Vic and, and Russ saw, and uh, <clears throat> bringing it to your attention at this time so that you everybody knows what's going on. Um, you know, I um, I think that it's uh, you know it's something that we just need to address and how we're going to address it, you know, I don't know yet. That's what we're going to look into and, and move forward. Um, I, uh, before we end the meeting, we have the management report that's posted. I just want to point out that the draft of the right town park financial statement is, uh, is attached as of December 31st. It's just a draft. It won't be final till it's audited. But the good news through all of this, um, when we passed the budget last year, we were projecting a deficit of 
almost 231,000, and that was reduced to a deficit of 95,000. So there was a plus of over 135,000 um, in the actuals as opposed to the, the original budget, which is good. It's not good to be in deficit, but the deficit was uh, much, much smaller than was projected. So that's good news. And hopefully this year we'll make a profit. And that will depend once again on the weather. So let's hope for a really good Memorial Day, yeah. July 4th, and Labor Day. And every day in between. And every weekend in between, please. Okay. Does anybody have, else have anything else? Vic, uh, pardon me, uh, Josh, you disappeared from view. We have Vic up there. Do you want to you wanna say anything? Oops. Are you asking me, Gary? Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm asking for very, comments very, from the very, committee. Very, very kind of you. Um, I, I would be very happy to see us adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> That's succinct. You don't want to spend any more time with us? <laughs> he's not even spending time with us. It's the highlight he's got of his, day. <laughs> he's got his dinner on the, in front of him. We just can't see it. He's actually in Italy somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, if there's nothing else then, may I have a motion to adjourn? I think that was a first. <laughs> <laughs> We're, Josh made the motion, yeah. okay. Yeah. Emily seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Um, Gary. We're, we're out. <laughs>